thanks for coming back. Um, I hope you had a nice sleep. Do you guys have any questions from yesterday or no? I'm going to answer a question that I was talking about. Uh, sorry, what's your name? Joao. Joao, before. Uh, just for all of you to be aware. He was asking me yesterday about, you know, having an implementation of individual based models in like 4R. And I said that uh, if somebody paid me, I could translate it. <laughs> um, but it turns out that today we are actually going to see uh, an implementation of an individual. It's not the same one that we spoke about yesterday, but there is an implementation of an individual based model. So, yeah, I, I, I just told him and I, and I thought that maybe uh, some others might be interested. So just for you to know. Anyway, um, yeah, today, this is something like a bit weird. Uh, can, you, can you still hear me if I am like this? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to try to show you a little bit about how you can use data analysis and models for um, of the of the same kind of things that we were we have been doing so far, but uh, um, for specific ecological applications. And by applications, I mean stuff like, for example, management of uh, uh, you know different ecosystems to try to get them back to some desired state, which is usually like increased biodiversity, right? or uh, ecosystem functioning or something like that. So this is some uh, like, like, like what happens basically after what we saw yesterday. So yesterday we saw how to, how to better understand what are the effects of these environmental perturbations on natural communities uh, through, again, different data analysis and modeling approaches. Um, and today we are, we are going to try to see what happens af after, uh, you know, these effects have, have happened, ha after perturbations have occurred, how we can actually um, de design strategies to make this better and how to analyze the data to understand what should be the strategies that, that we need to do, right, or that we need to implement. So uh, one of the, obviously one of the main sort of, uh, yeah, one of the prime examples of, uh, of uh, management actions that, that are being taken and have been taken to protect biodiversity is the setup of uh, protected areas, protected areas for conservation. I'm guessing that you, all of you are familiar with what this is or more or less. So basically the idea is to set aside some, um, you know, part of the landscape or some piece of land to uh, protect uh, that ecosystem or that habitat from human intervention. Um, I just put here like a map of all the protected areas around the world. Um, and uh, even though it's, it looks like there is like a lot of green, which are the protected areas, uh, actually, the fraction of protected areas are very small when compared to, to the entire um, uh, available land in the world, right? So there are like current efforts to, I think that in Europe, the target is to have like 30% uh, or something uh, like that by 2050, 20% uh, of the land protected. Um, and there are also other different types of uh, uh, considerations because protected areas are, can be of different kinds, right? So they have different levels of protection depending on uh, what is the, like the impact that is allowed within them. Some of them are, are like very restricted, some very strict in, in what humans can do inside. Some of them are very relaxed. Um, and this is kind of, I mean, it, it makes sense, right? Because the, um, the, main, the main sort of uh, conflict or consideration to make when, when you try to set up these protected areas is to, to account for the fact that, that uh, there, there are conflicts in terms of human activities. So the, the level of protection that you can set on an area will uh, depend on, on 
on the activities that humans want to carry there and you know economic growth and all that so so usually what this means basically effectively is that usually protected areas are set in places where there is no human interest right so in a very uh, steep hill where you cannot build buildings uh, or you cannot um, set up crops or you know in remote desertic areas because of the same reason and it, it's easy to see that this is not the best approach to protect biodiversity right because there might be places where you have a lot of uh, species and uh, complex ecosystems that are not in these remote areas so that that is like uh, one of the main challenges um, and one of the things that uh, uh, you know we, with the tools that we that we have been looking at um, uh, during these days, like for example, the meta community thing uh, framework, is that you could think of these protected areas as uh, local patches in your in in your meta community, and then you can think of these uh, connections between the patches as corridors between protected areas, and then you can start developing models uh, or predictions about what are the conditions for connectivity between protected areas and the size of the protected area and et cetera, if you want to enhance particular aspects of your system, right? Um, and, and people are using these kind of models to precisely design strategies like that. Um, I'm not gonna go into, in detail into these kind of models because uh, you know, we have already seen that to some extent in, in those other uh, lectures. But I just wanted to uh, highlight that, that you can use these kind of models to uh, uh, tackle these, these problems. And this is something that uh, I am currently doing with, uh, uh, with one of my PhD students. But the most inter I mean, what, what concerns us here today basically is how we, can, um, how we can actually assess whether, sorry, yeah. Question, uh, how old is this idea of protected uh, areas? And can they be seen of some kind of ecological experiment? Because maybe I could, someone could imagine that these areas could be more controlled in order to maybe try to, to get all the networks and interactions between species. Yeah, um, the first question, I don't really know when was like the first protected area set. Um, that's like, oh, you know, you know the answer. He knows. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, uh, as John said, the, the oldest protected area in the world is the Yellowstone National Park in the United States. Oh, yeah. But the idea of a protect, protected area is older than that because in uh, Europe, the kings would have like a <clears throat> a game reserve where they could hunt. And that areas uh, were protected. And actually, uh, some think that those are actually the only pristine environments that are still left in Europe, because those areas are very ancient and have been protected for centuries. Well, when was that? Like, which year? Oh, it's m most of these areas, I think, are like, I, the year I don't know, but I think it's somewhere around the 18th century, perhaps. Okay. And uh, when was the Yellowstone established? Do you know, Joan? Yeah, I just Googled it, 1872. Cool. Well, that, that's the answer to your first question. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, I do think that uh, that thought of having like controlled large scale ecological natural experiments is really interesting. I mean, there are people doing something like that, like in the forest here in Brazil, actually, and in some forests in Borneo. Um, in which they, yeah, they have set aside like large pieces of uh, of natural land, and um, and they sort of track the development of the communities in there through time to, yeah, to see how how well they are doing. Um, and I guess this is kind of related what, to what I wanted to talk about in this figure, which is the fact that sometimes we don't we don't have like. A, um, like, like g good ways of quantifying whether these protected areas are, uh, are being effective, right? And I think that that is like very important, especially if you are 
trying to design new networks of protected areas in which you want to enhance biodiversity. Uh, so for example, in this, in this paper that came, uh, came out two years ago, they actually showed that at least for uh, these places here, which are um, tropical rainforests in different parts of the world, uh, if, if you only focus in uh, species of forest birds, uh, actually, biodiversity is not better off by in the, within the protected areas when they compare it with uh, the, the equivalent communities outside of protected area. Which means that, I mean, th this can be a little bit misleading because obviously you can have like um, a sp uh, spillover effects from the protected areas and so on. But still, you should expect like a, a stronger sort of effect of the protected area. Um, and I think that this kind of information is, uh, is useful because you can then use it in, in the models to, um, you know, to, to, to make sure that, that the sizes, connectivities, and so on of the protected areas are actually effective in, in the way that you want them to be. Right? Um, then there are some like, specific cases for some of the areas and only looking at threatened and uh, uh, near threatened species, then you know, there is an effect. And the reason for that is that protected areas, especially if they are like, protecting a specific kind of habitat, uh, they, are very, I mean, they are good at conserving the endemic species and the, the threatened species because that those species need that habitat. So if the habitat is not present, then the species won't survive. Uh, but this is for very specific, for a very specific kind of species. So then the question becomes whether you are interested in you know that particular species, or you want to have a more holistic view of the ecosystem for the thing that you want to protect. Yep. <laughs> um, I I think the. Uh, the, the area of the the, the, the the size of the area of the protected area should be um, important to yeah. know if this is this area is important or or could work or no or not. Uh, with the model, we can calculate the, the I don't know minimum area that the, it should have or something. Well, it depends on, on the type of model you're using, right? I mean, uh, uh, if, if you are interested in, in the area, then in models like the ones we were talking about yesterday, like for the meta community, for example, then you need to find a way of including uh, the, the size of the patch explicitly or implicitly. Um, like, for example, you can assume that uh, higher species in the food web need larger areas. So if your patch is smaller than something, then that species won't be there, and then analyze what happens to you know wh when when you vary the size of your patches, for example. Um, but yeah, I guess it depends on on the type of model that you are using for that. So what we are doing right now at the moment is basically um, relating the size. Uh, so my student has the has taken the protected areas um, the, it as uh, like as a pieces of, of land in the map and then calculating network and community properties within them and relating those properties to different aspects like for example size, uh, type of habitat and things like that. So that, that is the way in which we are doing that at the moment. Yep. And for different types of vegetation probably the size would change, right? Because I don't know, tropical forest or desert. I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. I don't know if anybody has looked at that, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised because uh, you know the, the the habitats that are uh, mostly um, sort of disturbed by humans tend to be the the ones that are more fertile, and because of that, they have higher, uh, for example, plant density and all that. So, uh, yeah, the size of protected areas in a desert, I expect them to be way bigger than, than the ones in, in the rainforest, for example. So th there should be a correlation there, but I, I, I don't know if anybody has looked at that. <laughs> Probably, yes. Yeah. Or maybe you can be the, w the first one to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Cool.
So yeah, the whole point of this is just to emphasize, again, I'm not going to like describe a specific model for this. I just wanted to, to yeah, like sort of tell you about the importance of uh, mixing empirical data analysis, like these kind of things, to really uh, be able to, to validate or to test the predictions of your model and then use models like the ones that, that uh, we, we have been speaking about, like meta communities and things like that, to see how biodiversity, not only in terms of species, but also the network, not only changes across the protected areas, but also sort of scales or like aggregates from protected area to protected. So if you have a network of protected areas, you can calculate your local alpha diversity and then um, your gamma diversity at the level of the network of protected areas and in that way um, try to, to establish whether your measures are being effective. And this is the kind of things that they are doing. In, uh, there is, yeah, there is uh, a reference here for you to look at that. So the next um, sort of um, ecological application I wanted to talk about today was uh, or is the management of invasive species. And here we have like um, a whole set of um, uh, theoretical predictions that come from food web theory uh, in which basically the, you know, it highlights the importance of uh, the potential for cascading effects uh, of, species, of species removals on other species in the ecosystems. And ever since these theoretical predictions back in the 80s and 70s, uh, people have actually been looking for evidence of this in different natural habitats. And it turns out that you know, it's, it, it seems to be very common. Like for example, in this uh, review that came out in, in uh, 2002, um, I think, uh, they, they showed that across different ecosystems, like for example, in kelp, kelp forests in, uh, in off the coast of Alaska, uh, or in marine intertidal communities, in rivers and even coral reefs, um, when you remove one of the species, like in, this, in most of these cases, the top predator, then you know, there are cascading consequences throughout the food web. Usually what happens is that the species two levels below becomes very abundant, um, uh, sorry, becomes less abundant because they uh, face more uh, predation by, by the primary consumers. Uh, and these kind of things help us to try to understand, uh, I mean, to, to think about what would happen in, in a scenario in which, for example, we can, we want, or we are interested in, in managing invasive species, right? Um, so usually or traditionally, the, the management of invasive species was thought of like, well, you know, there is an invasive species, we should remove it because it's, you know, it, it's not, like part of the ecosystem and it has some this kind of damage. But uh, um, until like the 2000 people uh, were not really thinking a lot on about what could be the consequences of doing that for other parts of the network, right? Uh, but if we, if we think along the lines of, uh, of this sort of cascading effects in food webs, we can see that if you have a situation in which you have a predator that has been introduced, so let's say invasive predator, and then uh, it is introduced in some um, community in which you have, uh, just for simplicity, three trophic levels here, um, and you have like a bunch of uh, plant species at the bottom, uh, primary consumers and then the top predators, and they are connected in some way. Um, so this is plant one, plant two, plant three, plant four, um, consumer one, two, and three, and then top invasive, top predator, and top predator one. So if, uh, if this invasive predator is consuming on all of these three intermediate species, then you know, 
again, based on the sort of theoretical expectations that we have, we can sort of intuitively know or predict that if we remove these species, then uh, you know the, the predation by these other top, top predators will increase. Uh, but you know, in general, these guys will still be okay, right? It's not like super. Uh, th there is not like a big change in the network. So in these kind of cases, it's uh, you know like let's let's say that go for the obvious management strategy. It's sort of okay. But if you have more complex situations in which you not only have this species as the invasive, but then you also have another invasive species, let's say, in here, then this becomes more problematic, right? Because if you um, manage or target only one of these invasive species, in this particular example, Let's say that you you also you manage this um, uh, top predator again. Then what would happen is that this uh, also invasive species will be released from the predation pressure, and then uh, it will have a stronger impact on the species that it sort of consumes on their prey. And then the populations of these, which were native or which are native species, will decrease as a consequence, right? Uh, and uh, these kind of things, I mean, this is just a toy example because it's sort of, it, it's just for, illu for illustration, but it illustrates the fact that when you have like a more complex community and when you have several invasive species together, then predicting the full consequences of that just based on you know, the intuitive ideas of food chains and all that is not that easy. Right? So that, that is the main thing. And that's what, uh, um, well, it, it's one of, of, of the common problems in invasive species management. Uh, and uh, we are going to talk a little bit about how we could use models to uh, try to predict better these consequences. But when we remove the invasive predator, wouldn't like the, as you just said, like the top predators like compensate for that on the invasive consumer? Yeah. So would the impact on, on the P1 and P2 like be that big or does like everything else compensate for the removal of the invasive predator in these dynamics you're explicit in here? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Yeah, because you said when we, before we had an invasive consumer right yeah. in the middle there. When we remove the invasive predator, uh, the other top predators like compensated for it. Yeah. But why is it different when we have an invasive consumer as well? Oh, because usually when you have invasive species, there are better than uh, than local species. So the the reason why a species is invasive, it's because uh, it can like uh, grow faster than the you know the the native species, and they would outcompete them. So the even if a species is in the same trophic level, if it, was, if it comes from an, an external community and it was adapted to other species and so on, usually when it gets here, it has like stronger um, effects on the species that it either compete, competes with or, or, or uses as resources. So when, you, when this is not an invasive species and you remove the invasive top predator, then this species would, let's say, or, or is it, it is expected to go back to normal, right? But uh, when it is an invasive species, even before, let's say, that this predator wasn't even introduced, right? You introduce this one alone, then the links, so that the effects of the invasive species on the other species were already stronger. So it was not having a strong effect only because this predator was here. Uh, but uh, wh what usually happens when you introduce a new invasive species is that its effect on, on the species it interacts with, it's, uh, it, it's like super massive, you know, like it's very big. And unless you have a way of controlling it, like in this example, for example, an invasive predator, 
then it, it can outcompete other species very quickly. Um, so the, this is very common, for example, uh, on, on pest control for you know, management of pests in crops. Uh, and actually one of the solutions, biological solutions that people use is to, in, to introduce a top predator on the crop, so on the pest species of the crop. But then, you know, this has been shown that the, it can have all sort of other consequences. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that is the reason why, because usually the invasive species, uh, so e everything else being equal, like without this guy, if you introduce a species here, these links are much more stronger than if this is a non-invasive consumer. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, as I said, one of the things that, uh, that we wanted to do was to try to uh, better understand what could be the consequences um, of managing an invasive species. And in particular, in this ecosystem, the, the Australian semi-arid ecosystem, this is obviously a, sem a simplified characterization of that whole system. But it, it, it was complex enough to, like, to try to understand what could be the consequences of removing uh, a, an inv a, a highly invasive species, actually. So in this system, we actually have three invasive species, which are the, the European rabbit, uh, the red fox and uh, the feral cat. So all of these things are not native to Australia, but they are like super abundant, especially in this part of Australia. Um, and then obviously they have found themselves embedded in the whole uh, Australian food web, which uh, again, just for simplicity, we only incorporated the dingo as the top predator uh, because it, it is a relevant species that not only controls the mesopredators, but it all look also uh, predates uh, or, or yeah, preys on, um, uh, on herbivore species like kangaroos that compete for the same resources as, in this case, the rabbit. And then we have here like the target of our management action. So we want this species um, to, to do better than it currently is. And the reason for that is because ever since the introduction of these three guys here, uh, many species of uh, small marsupials in Australia have gone extinct, and the ones that have remained are critically decreasing. Um, so it is, they, they are trying to put on pla in place like many different measures to try to eradicate um, these three species. Uh, and there, there is like a particular focus on, on rabbits. So I, I brought up this example to try to um, sort of illustrate how you could use models like the ones that we have been using so far to understand like system level properties and come up with general patterns and general mechanisms for in the, in, in, in the second session for assembly, in, last, in yesterday's session for, um, for, for this assembly, which is the effects of global change. Uh, but those were like, like uh, general attempts to understand the general um, uh, sort of behavior of, uh, of these complex networks, right? But we, we, haven't, we haven't actually looked at what happens if we want to look at a specific system. If, wanna, if we want to tell something about a specific situation in which, for example, you are, you are hired for um, you know, protecting or maintaining an ecosystem in a local area in a specific place. And the challenge of doing that is basically the fact that you need very specific information about that particular system, you know? Like sometimes the predictions that, the predictions that you have from more general models are not as targeted and precise as you want them to be if you are in a situation like this. Um, and the other, the other difference that you are going to find with, uh, in respect with models that you, we have been seeing over the last few days is that uh, here we took a different kind of modeling approach, which is instead of using uh, sort of continuous time uh, equations, uh, differential equations, 
uh, we use different equations. So we consider time as discrete events, uh, mainly because the species in here, we know that they reproduce uh, throughout at specific times during the year. And usually when you are modeling non-overlapping populations, I don't know if you are familiar with this or not, but uh, you, you, you use these kind of frameworks instead of uh, uh, more continuous approaches. Have you, have you seen either as part of this course or before uh, different equations and the situations in which you would use them? And yeah, all that's covered. Perfect, cool. So we don't have to go into that. But yeah, the important thing to remember is that usually in ecology, you use different equations for when you have non-overlapping generations, which means that individuals are not reproducing constantly all the time, but they have like specific times uh, in which reproduction events happen. So um, basically in, in, in this particular approach, we had like uh, um, specific equations. So what, one of the challenges of this is that you need to make sure that, uh, that each species is modeled as you observe it in the wild, right? And uh, the reason for this is because you inform the model with a lot of data. So this kind of approaches is very data intensive. So you need to have, so th these guys had like, uh, I don't know, decades of data on, uh, on the populations of all of these species and uh, also specific sort of life history traits that we know. Uh, and that's what, that's what allow us, allows us to do something like this. If you don't have this information, then it's very hard to develop these kind of approaches because you, you have no way of knowing how they interact with one another, right? So because we had, we had this, this specific situation in we, which we had a lot of data on all of these species, we could write equations based on empirical relationships between um, the, the parameters of the model and the, uh, and the, risk, the, um, the abundance responses to of, of each of the species, we were able to write the questions like this, right? So for example, we knew that the growth rate uh, or, or the, um, the numerical response of uh, each of our species behaved in this kind of way. So this was for the herbivores in particular but if you go to that reference there, you're going to find the same expressions for all of the other species in the food web. Uh, and, and as I said before, all of this has been fit from empirical data. So all of the parameters in here come from, from specific observations of each of the species in the system, right? So here you have like a, a natural sort of rate of decline, which is A. And it's different for each of our herbivores. This function is slightly different for the predators. So you, if, if you're interested in, in the mathematical um, uh, details, you can, you can go to the paper and see each one of the different equations. But just for you to see what are the, the sort of information that goes into these models. Uh, then you have a rate of uh, what they call amelioration of this uh, rate of decline. And then this is, you know, where the interaction with, in this case, vegetation, so where this link comes into play. So here, this arrow from vegetation to the herbivores, this is what is encapsulated in this term of the equation. And then here you have the, the, pre, the, predation, the, the predation pressure by, by the predators. And this is how you calculate the uh, so you use this rate of increase to calculate the abundance of the species in the next time step. In this particular model, our time steps were quarterly. So each the, we divided a year in four in four parts in four periods, uh, and these these events happened for different species uh, in this within these time periods. Yep. 
just curious, what kind of data from the field can be used to tr is translated into this? What kind of data is, has to be collected for us to... Yeah, basically that? what you do is you usually have like, uh, like abundance through time. And then this abundance might look like, for example, like this. Um, let's say that this is the abundance for the rabbit. And then uh, uh, you, aside from this, you also have an estimate, an estimation of the, of what is the vegetation available, like through time. Um, and then you fit this data. So this is not how the data looks like, right? It looks like a bunch of points like this and this also and then you try to fit some function to this and in this particular case the function that that had like the best fit uh, was something like this that's why the different functions are different across species because when you repeat this process and you try to statistically fit the the function that better matches your data different functions might be relevant for different species. So that, that's how you, and then, yeah, as I said, you might, you might fit a line to this, um, um, to, to this data points as a function of, uh, of for example, the, the level of vegetation that you have. Instead of, yeah, maybe instead of, you can do it with vegetation or usually you have the, the data through time but then you can you know, project it into the equivalent or the corresponding vegetation value for, uh, you know, for that data point. And then you basically fit this as a function or yeah, the, the, the rate of increase, which is basically this slope here to, to the value of the vegetation. Yeah. Oh, I have another question. Yeah. Um, I just have a question. What is ameliorated, like the C term there? Well, it's, uh, I mean, they call it ameliorated in the sense that this is your natural rate of decrease. And this would be based on how much you are eating by how much, you know, whatever you are getting out of your, uh, you know, resource actually helps you in preventing your decline, basically. But it's just a constant, you know, it's a parameter that, you know, basically tells you how, how good or how efficiently you are converting your, uh, your resources into growth. Yeah. Uh, my, my question is, this model was created f to fit the data or? Yeah. Oh, okay. So they did not make the, this before just thinking in the phenomena? was just to feed the data, like this exponential there. Yes? Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the function was uh, the function that best fit the data that, that they had available. Okay. So then you, you take that function and you use it in the model as the way that you know this population grows uh, as a function of, of its interactions. Yeah. Okay. That's why I was saying that it's a very, what I'm trying to, to do here is to illustrate how very different the approach of doing like a theoretical model, like the ones we were talking about the, the, the previous days, is from when you want to do an ecological application for a specific system, right? Because in those cases, we were talking about, you know, like a random model. We created some network structure that it didn't have to have some attached um, specific meaning to a particular system and we just explore different parameter values to see what happens and you know try to provide predictions uh, whereas in here we are trying to model the specific behavior of, of a specific set of species in a specific location so this model wouldn't be transferable to any other ecosystem in the world you will have to do if you wanted to use this approach to, I don't know, understand the dynamics of an ecosystem here, then you will have to repeat this whole thing for your specific system. So collect data for decades, then use these relationships to fit all of these functions, and it's, it's like a very laborious thing to do, basically, yeah. Cool.
And then aside from the numerical response, which tells you how fast they grow, then uh, we also had, I mean, we, we needed to know also what is the, um, the sort of uh, rate at which they eat uh, resource, uh, yeah, resources, right? So, or what they, the rate at which they consume resources. So that was given by expressions that uh, look more or less like this. Well, not more or less, that look like this. <laughs> um, in which the body size, which is one of the characteristics that we have been looking at, one of the traits of the species that we have been looking at on other contexts, um, actually comes into play. So body size is uh, like an important factor in determining how fast a predator consumes its uh, prey. And this is again the case for uh, the herbivores, but you can see the, all of the functional responses for, um, for all of the species in the system. And you also have to, the other thing to note here is that the, one of the things that changes from this model to the ones we have been looking at is that you, you will always find this kind of notation in which you are looking at what was, in this case, the abundance at the previous time step, right? Uh, so t is the current time, and then t minus 1 is what happened just the, the time step before. And you just iterate this. So you, in this case, you don't need to use like solvers or anything like that, but well, I'm guessing that you already know this, but basically what you do is you calculate this over and over again for each time step. Yep. Could you talk a little bit more of what would be numerical function of responses and can it be other responses than just What, what would be the what, sorry? The difference between numer a numerical and a functional response and there is others than growth rate and body mass? The, there is others what, sorry? Others responses. No, in this uh, particular model, we only have this, uh, these responses. So the numerical response is basically the, um, the relationship that you use to calculate the, the abundance in the next time step. So this, what this tells you is uh, uh, how fast is the species going to grow from one time step to the other. And the functional response is what is, it's to calculate what is the effect of the consumer on the resource, right? So when I have, once I have this functional response, which tells me how much, um, how much in this case, for example, let's say that the N for us is a rabbit. This is a generic, the generic response we use for all the herbivores, but we, but we had to do this for each of the one, two, for the three herbivores that we had. So let's assume for now that it was the rabbit. So basically what this tells you is how much of vegetation, the population of rabbits that you had in your system ate at that time step. And then you use this number to remove it from the vegetation variable, uh, from the vegetation node. And that is basically the, the vegetation in the fo so the vegetation in the following time step would be how, it, how the vegetation will grow minus all of these things from all of the herbivores. Yeah. Just, uh, I think I missed this. Was the scale of this experiment, like it's a, a whole ecosystem level? Or yeah. is it like a, a region of Australia? No, no, this wasn't based on experiments. This was based on, on empirical data. So this is from... Some of the, the, the data comes for different species comes from different studies and they did data collection on different parts of Australia. Uh, so we just sort of assume that they interact in roughly the same way in different parts of Australia. Uh, but uh, yeah, it has been observations at specific transects and locations that they have been doing for, I don't know how many decades, probably like three, three decades or something like that. So they, they basically go out on, you know, on trucks and they count how many rabbits they see while, while driving along some road. So, and they repeat this over and over. And, uh, yeah. 
I think that the kangaroos are counted by helicopter. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, pro the vegetation is probably from GIS stuff. Yeah. Uh, my question is how you you get this equations in a program and then you find that this is the one minus exponential could be like logarithmic plus e square and blah, blah. yeah well you usually start by knowing what are the variables that you want to relate so for example in this case uh, you want to get the r of the rabbits as a function of v and then you plot that data in, you know, uh, in, 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 a, in a plot. And then usually, I mean, I am not like uh, uh, an expert on, on, on how to, to decide which function is which, but usually what I do is I look at, at, the, at the relationship and I think, well, I think that this looks like, for example, an exponential. And then I, you know, fit the data to, to that and that's, uh, uh, I mean, obviously, we try different things. We try, like, for example, um, if, uh, if, if I'm trying to fit a power law, I might try also a truncated power law or a, an exponential function or something like that. And then um, once you have, like, an ensemble of candidate functions, then you compare their fit to the data using some statistical index, like, for example, the AIC or things like this. And then you say, well, this is the function that 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 better approximate but but the 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 specific functions that you try uh for starters that that is uh, basically your creativity <laughs> you know like uh, there is no one who's gonna tell you that you will have to think about what what is your intuition about what what are the the potential best functions that would fit that data I don't know uh, how how much of uh, like statistical modeling are you guys used to do, or do any of you do data analysis, or is just mathematics and simulations? Can you put your hands up if you do data analysis? Okay, so a few more. Then. Yeah, um, it's like um, it's like when you try to you know like find a relationship between some, for example, species richness or some index of biodiversity and some environmental variable. Sometimes your data doesn't look like a straight line, so you cannot fit a linear model. And then you try to, uh, you know, come up with a better function that fits that. So that, that's pretty much the kind of the same thing. Yeah. Cool. So. Here, I just put the code for illustration so you can see how these kind of things are implemented. And the first thing to notice is that if you, if you look at the first gray box, it's full of very specific numbers. <laughs> and these are all the parameter values that came from this uh, very complex process of like fitting data to our functions. Uh, and this is one of the key differences between when you do the kind of modeling we spoke about before and this, uh, because here you are actually working with uh, empirical data that uh, will hopefully uh, help you understand better that specific system. Uh, I mean, obviously, after we, we have like an estimation of, uh, of the parameter values that we think better represent the system, but then you usually do um, some sort of sensitivity analysis to sort of quantify which one of these parameters the model is more sensitive to. So in that way you can tell, for example, if you are a, a, um, a field ecologist and you are developing these kind of models, it can give you information or it can suggest to you which information you need to get better, right? So if, if you find in your sensitivity analysis that some parameter is having a strong effect on the outcome, then you, you should try to do more experiments or more data, anal uh, sorry, data collection to get a better idea, a more accurate idea of what is the value for that parameter. Yep. Um, 
there is any database where we can find some data set similar to this to apply some similar analysis? Yeah, all this data is available in different papers that, uh, because before I started doing this project, um, some the, the relationships between the, the variables, all of that has been studied for like a long time. So the references in that paper, uh, you are going to find the data there and, and all the... But they didn't deposit in some, I don't know, general database. It's only from the paper. Yeah, well, some of the papers put it in some databases, but it's uh, sort of dispersed in different places because I didn't, um, you know, I, I, I didn't use or I didn't take their data and put it somewhere. They just had d different authors had different databases and they okay. had it in different places. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, that's the first thing to notice here. And the other thing to notice that, uh, yeah, I wanted to highlight, aside from you know the sheer number of numbers that are here, is also this thing, right? So here you can see that uh, one of the things that you have to do when you implement these kind of models is that for each specific, I mean, this is very extreme because each specific interaction was different from one another. Sometimes you might find that a few interactions might behave similarly and then you can compress your code because you don't have to define as many equations. But in this particular case, so you need to write each equation separately and that reflects on the code. You know, it's no longer a very succinct piece of code like the one we used the other day in which the entire system, regardless of the size of the matrix, was just that little piece of, you know, generalized lot cobalt terror function, right? So, you, you really have to think about not only the functional responses and the numerical responses, but the fact that uh, um, you know, the, the modeling exercise is like an entirely different kind of approach to, to more um, sort of theoretical kind of models, if you see what I mean. Cool, so do you guys have any questions about this? All good? Here I put some examples of uh, what is the outcome of doing that. And you see one of the first things that you see when you are working with different equations is that, you know, the lines are no longer like very smooth and nice as you see in, in ODEs, right? And the reason is precisely because you are calculating some um, uh, different values at different time steps. And, um, well, it has been shown in, uh, uh, in, in, the, um, in the ecological literature that uh, discrete systems are more prone to chaotic dynamics. I don't know if you are familiar with the work by May um, in which you know, he showed how the logistic map can have all sort of very different, nice, interesting behaviors. Um, and, uh, and this is you know, an example of that. You know, the, the dynamics are very chaotic. And the nice thing is that this actually reflects, if you look at the data of these species, they look very much like this. So um, it, it gives you some sort of degree of confidence that the modeling approach is doing the right thing. And this is a, a comparison between what happens when you, when you have um, no control. So this is how the system would behave normally. And this is what happens when you um, manage the rabbit or kill rabbits during from time step 200 to 400. So you can see here how the, the black line is, uh, um, you know, it, it's, it's much lower than in the plot above because we are intentionally managing the rabbit. And then here you can see the flow on effects of that, right? So as soon as you, um, manage rabbits, then the fox and the cats sort of decrease very badly, but then they start recovering, and this is very bad for the small mammal here. Uh, and this is one of the things that we were interested in looking at. So what we did was uh, taking, like running a lot of simulations using this model, um, and uh, basically what we found is that Managing rabbits is 
relatively okay for, uh, I mean, for the small mammals up until some value. In, in this particular case, 40% of, uh, of the populations of rabbits being killed. But then after that, it is actually bad for the small mammals to kill the rabbits. And the reason for that is that, uh, uh, you know, the, the mesopredators, so these two guys, they are still able to eat a lot of herbivores. And when they don't have rabbits available, they switch to the small mammals. So even though, uh, you know, that sort of rationale is sort of intuitive, what we didn't know, what we did not know, was the specific values at which, well, first of all, the, the, the general behavior of this line and the specific values at, what, at which that this happens, right? So this is the kind of things that, that the quantitative models like this can help you go beyond the reasoning that we were doing when looking at that other picture, at this, right? So with this, you can have an intuition of what can happen. But with this, you can actually quantify and be, and, 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 you know, be more precise about what should be the unexpected consequences that you would expect. Sounds good? Yeah. <laughs> Any questions about that? These plots, the, these dots are data points. These like are, yeah, these are the average across. Uh, so what, what each of these points represents the, the median, so the average of across replicates of the median abundance during the last 200 time steps of the simulation. So what we are quantifying is what is the, the abundance or the median abundance after you know you have applied the, the the management and you are let's say going back to normal you know like because you one of one of the i guess particularities of this system is that obviously you cannot or well you could if you had endless money but you cannot really keep killing rabbits all the time you know you, you usually how this works and and this is another thing that that you can explore with these models is what happens when you have realistic management strategies. Like, obviously, you need to have some sort of uh, uh, resource trade off as to how many or how much you can actually manage a population. So, in this case, we assume that we had only some limited time to be able to manage the population and then see what happens after. So, the, each data point here is. Uh, across many different, I think we did like 500 uh, replicates, uh, the average of the median across the last 200 time steps of the simulation. So in this plot here, uh, oh sorry, not, not 200, 100. So from here to here, we calculated medians for each of the species. Um, and then across all of that, that is one value for each of the species, the median across here. And then across all of the replicates, we averaged all of those values, and that is the point here. Yeah, each, each of these points is that average. Okay. Yes? After how long can we say that an invasive species, it's no longer invasive, but it, it's <laughs> part of this environment. Because even here, for example, our, uh, we cannot get rid of all the rabbits, otherwise the system would just collapse. So, Yeah, that is a very good question and a topic of, uh, it's highly debated uh, amongst uh, uh, invasion ecologists, <laughs> uh, especially in Australia, because uh, uh, some people, you know, as you say, they they argue that you know one th that these species are already established, that they are part of the ecosystem, that they shouldn't be, uh, and this is particularly true for for the dingo, not so much for the other three guys, but uh, a lot of people think that uh, that this that this species is actually uh, already part of the system, right? 
Uh, and to some extent it's true because the invasion of the dingo into Australia happened like hundreds of years ago. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, but in reality, these species displaced the, the, the previous top predators in Australia, right? So after how much time you can say a species is no longer invasive, uh, I guess it depends on your definition of invasive species, right? If you think, and it, and it takes into account temporal time scales. So these species, none of these species were part of the ecosystems like traditionally. But if you think about the ecosystem functioning that is currently being fulfilled by this community, then probably you would be right into thinking that, that you know, removing this species would make the ecosystem not function in the way that it currently is. Which, but that would always be the case in, in any sort of uh, invasive species management scenario, right? So, um, so I guess that I don't really have an answer to that question. <laughs> I don't know if, uh, uh, if you can at some point say, well, now this is a native species. But it, it's, uh, it's subjective and it's a matter of what you consider your pristine ecosystem, right? What is the, what is the ecosystem or the state you want to go back to, basically? Yeah. Just to add on the discussion, uh, I think it's important that we, with the distinction that has to be made is the distinction between what is an exotic or alien species uh, which is a terrible name, but uh, people use it. And what is an invasive species? Because uh, there are some uh, species that are not from the place. They are exotic species. And uh, they don't necessarily interfere so much with the ecosystem. And actually, it, the, this, uh, this migration and uh, colonization by new species of other habitats is natural, but the things that we humans uh, took this to a whole other level, so that's why we see a lot of these problems. But some exotic species do not have this that we call an aggressive uh, demographic behavior, in which, uh, as the professor said, they end up like capturing all the ecosystem for themselves. And in that, that's a problem, but there are some species that are exotic and uh, sometimes people don't see uh, a negative effect. And then this discussion becomes even harder. Should I, I spend money trying to displace these species just to go to a pristine ecosystem before that one? Would that be good or bad? It doesn't make sense. So it's a very hard question indeed. Yeah. The important thing is that you can actually, regardless of uh, whether the invasive has some, uh, sorry, the species has some label, you know, exotic, in, uh, invasive, whatever, alien, uh, is that, you know, you can use some approaches like this to try to uh, have a better guess of what could happen if you try to eradicate it, right? So, cool. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, the other sort of, um, kind of ecological application, I thought it was interesting, it would be interesting for you guys to, um, you know, to have a look at, is uh, the disease spread in wildlife populations. So disease spread in wildlife population is, you know, it's one of the main issues of conservation concern, especially for particular species that are threatened with extinction. And there is like a lot of uh, work looking into these things. And uh, the sort of more common approach that has been used to this is the, the traditional uh, um, sort of epidemiological framework of SR, SIR or SIS or SIRE. There are like different ways that people describe this depending on how many compartments you have in this state-based model. So this is a state-based model in which you have, uh, in this particular case of the SIR, you have three states. S for susceptible, I for infected, and R for recovered. Uh, and you have transition rates between the state, between states, in which, for example, uh, for susceptible individuals, they can transition into an infection 
uh, state with a rate beta uh, and an encounter and the likelihood of encountering an infected individual. And then from being infected, individuals transition into being recovered with some um, gamma probability and so on. And we can implement these uh, kind of models in using, um, you know, ODEs, very simple like the ones that we have been looking at. And again, if you have, if you are interested in like the general properties of this system and the general behavior and what would happen if you vary these three parameters, then I guess, you know, it, it's, uh, as you can see here, it's relatively easy to implement. Uh, and then what you do is you play with different parameters and you get behaviors of the system that look like this. And, you know, people, th this approach has allowed us to understand better uh, what, what should we expect from epidemics under different contexts and even within networks of uh, local patches of populations that can get infected. Uh, but the thing is that some of the processes involving the transmission process are, are very hard to capture with these kind of models, right? Because there are uh, particularities of individuals and since transmission is, you know, an individual to individual sort of process, then uh, sometimes this heterogeneity across interactions between infected and non-infected individuals might be relevant to understand the system level behavior. Um, and for that, uh, what people have been doing is to use individual based models to try to model epidemic, epidemic dynamics. So before going into that, uh, into how you can do this, I, I thought that it might be interesting to have like a little play here with uh, this software. Have you, have you guys heard of NetLogo before? Well, NetLogo is an it's a, it's, it's a individual-based modeling platform that, uh, well, as you can see here, it's very easy to use and to set up. So it's a, it's a very handy tool for prototyping uh, sort of rules of interactions between individuals and see what happens. Uh, so before starting making your life complex by, or complicated by, uh, by coding your own individual based model, you can use this to try your hypothesis in a very easy way. Uh, and I just thought that you guys could play a little bit with this uh, to, it, it's really good to give you a sort of an understanding of what is the concept of emergence at the system level from local interactions. So here in this, in this thing, you only define uh, local rules of what happens when one individual finds another individual uh, and how they move across the landscape. So in this particular example, individuals are just moving randomly. And then there is a probability that a, a, an infected individual will transmit the disease to another. And here you can uh, change different parameter values as well. You can change the initial conditions even. Uh, and when you start running this, in this little plot here, you can see what is the system level behavior that you get from the individual base model. So these lines here are not very different from what we got from, you know, from, from the um, system level sort of uh, high level approach, our ODE. Um, they, in some respects, they look similar, which means that, um, you know, those equations can capture um, some broad patterns in the behavior of, uh, of, uh, of the interactions between individuals, right? And that's why people use those models. Uh, but then you can see that there are some things that start going on and there are a few differences with, uh, with the higher level approaches. And that is what we are interested in here, right? The heterogeneity between individuals and how those differences, not only between individuals, but as we will see now, uh, between local populations that have different individuals, how the heterogeneity is there sort of percolate, percolate into, into the, the high, high level behavior of the system. 
uh, and, and change our view of uh, what can happen in, in the disease transmission process. So if you, yeah, as I said, if you are interested in changing, you can change parameter, parameter values here. So for example, you can change the infection rate uh, and you can change this as well. And then maybe you can say that they stay sick for longer and then you see how, you know, these lines here are very different from before. And if you are, if you are even more interested in like playing around with this, you can actually modify the code and even create your own code. Because you, in this, the nice thing about this platform is that all of these uh, interface objects and the whole thing, you, got, you can create them yourself, right? So, um, and in, if you go to this code here, um, you can actually change the rules of interactions between the individuals. Uh, yeah, for example, here you can change the way in which they reproduce and so on, and then recompile the code and see what happens of them. So this is this is basically how what individual based models are about, right? We have specific rules of one-to-one -one interactions. We are not saying anything or imposing anything on the system level behavior. And only from these local rules of interaction, we get those uh, population dynamic lines that we saw there. So using this kind of approach, uh, we wanted to create an application or to, yeah, to develop an application to understand better the trans. Yeah. In the simulation you showed just now, um, do you have like a replacement of the population waning immunity? Because it's not like the first SIR model. It could never be. No, it's not the same. What is the, happening that's like seeing all those cycles? And yeah, everything. yeah. No, it's not. Sorry, I, I should have made that clear. I didn't. Imp I mean, this is not an implementation of the other example. It's just, it, it's a separate thing. Uh, so in here, uh, they don't, they only change from one state to another. Uh, and then they reproduce, I think they have a, a reproduction rate. Uh. Oh, so, so you incorporate more susceptibles into the system and you like kill some people, uh, right? Let me check that. I am not entirely sure. Um, Uh, the number of individuals are changing the blue line, so there are people dying and yeah. then people born again. Yeah. yeah, there are people dying and you have to set a lifespan, which is a parameter, and then uh, with some, yeah, those parameters are the probably, and then there is like a reproduction rate. Um, so yeah, there is sort of a replacement of individuals that are getting uh, renewed with, and, and the system has a carrying capacity, so they won't grow more than that. Uh, that's the number of people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but this model have a, a OGE uh, that was based on, or no? No, no, I, well, I, I don't know if anybody has looked at, uh, this is just an example from, from NetLogo. But uh, yeah, they, in here you can actually choose many other examples uh, from, like if you want to look, for example, at predator prey dynamics, uh, you can go here and choose uh, sheep and wall or something like that. Uh, where are sheep and walls? Oh, no. Well, anyway, I can't find it now, but uh, yeah. Uh, 
let's say you are interested in flock behavior, for example. Then you can see how. Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> so, yeah. The I mean the the key thing here, what I was trying to illustrate, is that there is a. A, a big difference between, between modeling using that system level approach of the ODEs and modeling using the individual based approach of defining local rules of interaction, um, which will create the emergence of these uh, large scale patterns, right? So, because we had a system, as I was saying, uh, we were interested in understanding the disease dynamics uh, of uh, Tasmanian devil facial tumor disease. So Tasmanian devil, the only uh, remnant population is, in the island of, is, is on the island of Tasmania, which is off the coast of Australia uh, in the wild. And they, uh, they have been inflicted with a, with a tumor that is actually transmissible. It's a, different, it's a rare care, uh, kind of cancer because cancer usually cannot get transmitted, but, but this can. Uh, and they, what happens to them is that when they get the disease, they develop these sort of tumors on the face and then they eventually die. Um, so it's like a very big sort of conservation problem because they are trying to uh, find management strategies to, to, to stop this spread. Um, and what we did here was to adopt sort of a mixed individual base slash metapopulation approach. So we are now going to bring together two things that we have been looking at during the course. Uh, the metapopulation thing that we looked at two days ago and the individual based models that I just explained. And what we did was to, to create local populations of actual individuals that were modeled in an individual based fashion and connect these populations in a larger metapopulation. To define the actual structure of the metapopulation, uh, what Rowan, my master's student, did was to, she took the habitat layer vegetation. Actually, you could even say that here we're also um, incorporating uh, stuff from yesterday's lecture, right? We looked at how to map biodiversity in, uh, you know, in, in, in um, uh, in some known given geographical location. And this, instead of mapping the presence of the actual species, we were, we were mapping the, the habitats that they prefer. And this is this map over here. So this is the habitat preferred by, by the devil across the island of Tasmania. And then based on those patches of habitats, uh, she created this discrete metapopulation structure and as I said before, inside each of these little dots, which are now our, our local patches, uh, we had an individual base model in which uh, we define local rules of interaction. Uh, in this particular case, the relevant interaction is fighting. So when they fight with each other, uh, they transmit the, this tumor to each other. And the likelihood that they are going to fight is based on how close they are to each other and how big is their home ranges. And this information is the only thing that we use to define local interactions, as you might see in the code, uh, between these individuals. So here we have a situation in which an individual-based model is going on locally, and then we have a, a network of populations that are connected in some way. And these local populations can exchange individuals based on some dispersal parameter. So individuals move from patch to patch and they become part of the new patch. Uh, and basically what we were able to do with this was to replicate the, uh, the, the spatial wave of, um, of disease prevalence across the island. So this map here, which is uh, uh, an outcome of our simulations um, basically 
describes pretty well what happened in reality. All of this is, uh, uh, I mean, we, we have, the, there is data uh, about the, the different places the disease has reached since its introduction around here in 1996 and how it has wiped popula local populations across the landscape from here to here. Yep. Uh, for example, in this model, they only, the infection only occurs when they have interaction. How could you uh, insert in the model when the, the disease or the virus is on the environment as well? For example, for marine disease, marine virus that the animals don't need to really interact with each other that because the virus is in the water, yeah. how could you include it in the model? Well, I guess you could have like a sort of a viral load variable in your patch uh, and then based on and keep that like a, as, a, as an attribute of your local patch and then, uh, and then assume that with some probability, some individual will uh, like get the disease by, by having that. But if, if you're only if your only concern is on this viral load at the local level, then I don't, and, and interactions between individuals don't matter, then I, I don't think that I would go for an individual based model because it's more computationally expensive. Uh, and I think that you, you are probably okay with using a more sort of ODE approach because you, ju you just need to have this variable and then with a rate uh, of something that depends on, on that variable, then new individuals get infected, right? Or that your pool of infected individuals increases basically with that probability. So it will be like, a, uh, like another rate in this equation that depends on, uh, yeah, like another extra term or even a, a weighted waiting term for this beta. Cool. So once we learned that our model was, you know, sort of uh, um, creating this sort of behavior, um, we we took specific parameter, but because we explored like different parameter values to see how changing, for example, dispersal or contact distance, uh, which is the likelihood that they will interact and things like that affect the, the disease spread. So we took, uh, we took those uh, specific parameter values and, and assumed that you know, the system behaves in that way using that, uh, those values. And what we did was to, um, to try to come up or design management strategies for stopping the spread of the disease. And uh, since we had a landscape that was basically a network, what we did was something similar to what, to what we spoke about the other day when, when we were talking about habitat fragmentation, right? So our um, management strategy, if you will, was basically to try to fragment habitat to keep the disease from going somewhere else, right? you have a network this time, a network of patches, uh, like in the meta populations or meta communities we were looking at the other day. So what is the best way of deciding which one of these dispersal corridors, or in our case, which nodes to isolate, so to uh, try to remove or avoid individuals to moving from and to a specific patch so how to isolate a specific patch. What is the best way of doing that to get the best outcome of uh, um, disease, of stopping disease spread? Uh, and because we are looking at, uh, at a network, then there are different ways in which you can do that based on the connectivity patterns of the local population. And this kind of rationale or sort of way of thinking you can also apply 
if you think about an ecological network as species and their interactions, and you want to see what happens when you remove particular species, so those that are more connected, those that are more central to the network, and so on, uh, you can apply the same way of thinking to metapopulations of patches. So in networks, you can calculate, for example, the, the degree, as we saw, the degree of each patch. Or you can isolate patches in a random way. So you just choose a patch randomly and you remove it. Or you can do a, a kind of a slightly more clever thing, which is calculating what they call centrality. So in networks, you can calculate specific numbers uh, for each of the nodes that tells you how central they are in the network. And by central, I mean that if you want to, to go from node A to node B, what is the, and you want to calculate all the paths amongst all of the, po all of the nodes in your network, what is the node, perhaps this one, through which most of these paths have to go through, right? So what, it, what is, it, it's, a, it's a different way of quantifying uh, connectivity, which is not simply the degree of the node, but actually how likely it is that if, if you need to travel or information needs to travel from one node to another, you have to visit that node. And by doing that, we identified like three ways, or we came up with three ways of uh, um, sort of managing our landscape. Or, remove, or identifying local patches to remove. And the three ways were doing this either randomly, so choose a patch randomly and remove it. Doing this uh, based on the degree of the node. So in this scenario here, we would remove this one first. And the third way, which was doing this based on its bitwinness centrality, which is one kind of network centrality. And if uh, uh, I'm obviously not sure that this is correct, but let's assume that this is the most central node in this network. So in this network, we would remove this first in the degree uh, approach, but we would remove this one first in the centrality approach, right? Are you all with me here? All good? So we basically found that uh, actually going by centrality is better in terms of the fraction of patches that are infected by the disease. So in, the, in here, in these plots, on the x-axis, we have the number of patches that have been removed or isolated uh, from the metapopulation. Um, and then on the first plot, we have total abundance of the metapopulation. The second plot is the proportion of infected patches. And the last one is uh, genetic diversity. For now, the genetic diversity part is not important, just the middle plot here. And you can see that for uh, um, when we remove patches by their degree, the effect is not really super great, which is kind of surprising because degree is a kind of how connected you are. It's a measure of how connected you are in the network. Uh, but it turns out that it's even worse in terms of stopping disease spread than removing or isolating patches randomly, right? That was kind of surprising. Um, but uh, regardless of that, you know, the strategy that worked better for this was to, re to, to isolate, patch isolate patches based on, on the centrality of the nodes. And uh, I think that this is a nice example of how you can use network theory or yeah, network tools to actually come up with some strategies for, in this case, disease spread um, or for conservation in general. Um, and uh, yeah, we showed that it's very different than, than doing it in, in a way that is not informed by you know, your metapopulation structure. Um, so yeah, I think that that's pretty much all I wanted to say today. Um, and uh, I don't know if you guys have any questions before we, yeah. Question? Um, I know that it's like recently with COVID, people have been working on networks and is isolating patches and all with non-pharmaceutical interventions. 
how would you go about in an ecological system isolating an all? Yeah, I guess that in this particular case, I mean, because obviously we thought about this when, you know, like drafting the discussion and all, well, in general. Um, I think that in this case, basically what, what we were thinking were, was, well, is there a realistic way in which you can isolate these patches, right? So uh, there are some parts of this landscape in which isolation could be um, like achievable in the sense of not so much isolating the patch per se, but like try to relocate individuals that go to a particular patch. But at least you have identified patches uh, in which, you know, by applying whatever is the strategy that you want to apply, are more likely to succeed than others, right? So I am not implying that in here that, that the strategy should be to like remove the patch, which would mean destroying habitat. <laughs> uh, but uh, there are, uh, like for example, translocation might be a, a good alternative because as soon as you see that a healthy individual moves to that patch, then you can uh, move it somewhere else. And that could be a, an achievable thing to do. But yeah, you're right in, into thinking that sometimes we have nice results into the models that do not necessarily are achievable, right? So, yeah. Yeah. With So I just want to add that we did like similar things with the COVID spread and then knowing which nodes are like the most important, we know where to test more and where you should like invest more money to take care of people. So this can be very useful even though you cannot like isolate the population, you know like where to put your efforts. And we indeed like we did that in the beginning of the pandemics for the Sao Paulo state. And I had another question, more like how did you compare the model results to, or if you compare to what actually happened, like if you have data and uh, on the real phenomena, because I don't know, even in epidemiology in humans, it's hard to have data yeah. on like, and we usually use like um, death data, but I don't know how it is for animals, for example, I'm curious. Yeah. No, in this particular case, we didn't, we were not able to implement any of these measures. Uh, but there are people, so one of, the, one of the colleagues who was involved in this project, he's act, like actively collecting data on mortality and, uh, you know, all of these things in different populations across Tasmania. So you, you, could, uh, you could use data to validate at least the first part of the model. Uh, for the second part, you will need to set up, you know, like a way of uh, uh, actually isolating those populations that that we have identified as true. But uh, I, at least to my knowledge, no one is doing that yet. Yeah, <laughs> but that's that's the hope. I mean, that that's the only reason why would we would do something like this, right? Because we uh, we think that uh, that this could actually help in in designing these strategies and eventually test the model. Yep. Good. Cool. Thank you.